First things first, I'd like to extend my condolences to the family and personal friends of Ravi Zacharias. I do not celebrate his passing by any means, I just think a lot of his arguments were bad, and I actually had this video planned out many months before his death, so... sorry. In the clip we're about to see, Ravi Zacharias was asked a pretty simple question. How is it that God and free will can be compatible with each other? Pretty standard question, surely a man who has written over 30 books on Christianity would have a simple, knockdown answer ready to go. Right? My uh, question is, since the Bible has been scientifically disproven as far as all the claims, you know, through evolution, the theory of evolution, uh, archaeology, you know, Noah's Ark, Adam of Eve, since we know this didn't happen because of our science, I guess science nowadays, um, my question is, how do we have, according to the Bible, how do we have free will if God is this omniscient being that knows everything about us, everything we will do, and he pretty much knows our outcome before we're even created. So he creates us knowing everything we'll do. Since we can't surprise him by our actions, we, are in, we have no free will. Our choices have been predetermined and that the act of judgment is completely immoral because he knows what we're going to do. Nothing can surprise him. Now, let's be clear on this because a lot of people seem to struggle with this idea. This question is an internal critique of Christianity. The person asking the question is not saying that because we all agree that free will exists, therefore God can't exist. He's saying that Christians claim that free will exists, which seems incompatible with their other claim that God exists. This is an internal critique. Thank you for the question. And uh, before you go into an auditorium, if you give a sheet of paper and ask us to write 20 possible questions, that'll come. We've never heard a new one in all of these years that go by. They're pretty much the same questions. They're the same questions because you don't really answer them in the first place. And this video actually goes on for several more minutes before Ravi even addresses the question. So... Wait, wait, stop. Go back. Has anyone ever provided proof of God's in existence? All right, I can't not respond to this. I want to read for you what David Berlinski says about the scientific naturalistic worldview. Do you know who he is? One of the world's leading physicists, who is an agnostic, borders on atheism, but took issue with <clears throat> Richard Dawkins's book, the, De the God Delusion, and wrote a book called The Devil's Delusion. Here's what he said. <clears throat> Has anyone ever provided proof of God's in existence? Not even close. I've never provided proof of the non-existence of Optimus Prime either. Guess I'd better start watching out for Decepticons. I'm on to you. Dodge. On a more serious note, you can't just ignore the arguments that do purport to prove that the biblical God cannot exist, such as the contradiction between the God you've described and free will, or the problem of evil or the problem of non-belief. Now, of course, I'm not saying that these debates are settled, but you can't just hand wave them away without at least directing your audience to some refutations. Maybe in one of your books, perhaps? Has quantum cosmology explained? All right, guess we're moving on. Has quantum cosmology explained the emergence of the universe or why it is here? Not even close. Okay, sure. What does that prove? The fact that we can't explain the specifics of why our universe is the way it is doesn't prove anything. Our inability to explain something does not mean that God did it. I mean, this is an adult man and well-known apologist who doesn't seem to understand the concept of argument from ignorance. Now, if you have specific evidence of intelligence being behind life or the universe or something, then please present it. But lacking that, you cannot simply add intelligence to whatever force presumably caused life or the universe, if indeed causation is even the right framework to use in this context where we're talking about the origin of time itself. For more information on God of the Gaps, you can watch my video called Nature of the Gaps, linked below. It makes sense, don't worry. Have the sciences explained why our universe seems to be fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life? Not even close. If you'd like to hear my response to the fine-tuning argument, you can watch my video Refuting Fine-Tuning, linked below. I originally was going to put this content in this video about Ravi Zacharias, but I quickly realized there were too many problems with the fine-tuning argument for a video like this, so 
Moving on. Are physicists and biologists willing to believe in anything as long as it is not enough, not religious thought? Close enough. As I explained in my other video, the supernatural is real and useless, it's not that calling an idea religious or supernatural forces it out of the realm of science. It's actually the other way around. Ideas that aren't scientific and which aren't testable are the ones that end up being called religious. Religious ideas that are scientific and which do make testable predictions quickly lose the label religion, as we saw with the idea that the universe is not steady state, and as we saw with the behavior of magnets and their subsequent study. If you can present hard evidence of something that we currently call supernatural, like telekinesis or ghosts or something, scientists will eventually accept it, but you have to be prepared for that supernatural thing to take on the new label, natural, when that happens. Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proved to work? Medicine. Let's move on. Has rationalism and moral thought provided us with an understanding of what is good, what is right, and what is moral? Not close enough. Speak for yourself. Just because you can't figure it out doesn't mean it can't be done. There are plenty of moral philosophies which make no supernatural appeals whatsoever. In fact, in the Western world, it seems to be a rather uniquely Abrahamic idea that religion should have anything to do with morality. In ancient polytheistic pagan religions, like those which dominated ancient Greece and the Roman Empire, morality was not a dimension of religious practices. Ancient people largely viewed morality as the domain of philosophy. This should tell us that religion and morality are not inexorably linked. Has secularism in the terrible 20th century been a force for good? Not even close to being close. I think the phrase you're looking for is fascist totalitarianism. There, there's a, a tiny difference there. Try again. Is there a narrow and oppressive orthodoxy of thought and opinion within the sciences? All of them! Close enough. Citation absolutely needed. Maybe your ideas are just dumb. Does anything in the sciences or in their philosophy justify the claim that religious belief is irrational, not even in the ballpark? Well, it depends what the belief is. It does bother me when people broadly claim that there is no conflict between science and religion, or that there is conflict between science and religion, because religion could mean a lot of things, some of which do conflict with science and even basic rationality, and some of which don't. This really is a case-by-case -case claim with no broad answer. Is scientific atheism a frivolous exercise in intellectual contempt dead on? I see we're down to name-calling. Allow me to retort. Jane, you ignorant slut. <laughs> Are religious apologetics an emotionally driven exercise in self-delusion? <gasps> Dead on. Dead on. Now, I didn't say that, all right? I'm not quoting myself. I didn't say it. I just agreed with it enough to repeat it on stage. Honey, I didn't call you a bitch, okay? I said you were acting like a bitch. That's different. Please give me your name, sir. Ethan. Ethan? Yes. Ethan. What you're wrestling with is not uncommon. Many people from a scientific and materialistic worldview will say what you've said and come to that conclusion. The problem is what you mispositioned was your concern between determinism and free will. Wait, determin... Oh, right. Gee, that's what the video was originally about. Jeez. Okay, let's talk about determinism and free will. Problem is what you mispositioned was your concern between determinism and free will. I was, your application could have gone in many different directions, but you came to that one for some reason, which I was unfortunate, I think. At Cambridge, I listened to a talk at the Lady Mitchell Hall in 1990. So I tied an onion to my belt, which was the style at the time. When Ravi Zacharias is on stage, it's always story time. I listened to a talk at the Lady Mitchell Hall in 1990 by Stephen Hawking. As you know, he can't speak. He uses a speech synthesizer. His whole talk was on determinism and freedom. And you know what he concluded? That the tragedy with scientific materialism, if we take, it to take its assumptions, is that we are not free, we are totally determined. That was the world's leading physicist at that time saying, the very thing you're asking of the Christian faith, he pinned on your backs. Um, we're talking about Christianity, Ravi. Christians like you are the ones who assert that free will exists, 
and also that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and set everything in motion. So the question is, how are these things compatible within the Christian framework that you subscribe to? This is not a question that you can turn around on your opponent. This is an internal critique. The very thing you're asking of the Christian faith, he pinned on your backs as scientific materialists. You can go right online and, and trace it. Lady Mitchell Hall, 1990, somewhere on March, April, May, that time I was in attendance. And he said, the only escape I have is since I don't know what has been determined, I may as well not be. Well, yeah, pretty much. Even if determinism is true, which I think it is, it would still seem as though we had free will, since we can't perfectly predict everyone's behaviors second by second, not even our own. Now, it is an interesting, broad-reaching question which says, would things look any different under your model compared to mine? As just one example of this, before we knew that the Earth moved around the Sun, it certainly looked like the Earth was fixed in place and the Sun moved around the Earth. But if the Earth actually moved around the Sun, well, how would that look any different to us as we sit on the Earth? It wouldn't, at least not with our naked eyes. In this same way, I fully grant that it feels like we have free will as we go about our daily lives. But if determinism were true, well, how would that manifest any differently from what we experience now? If determinism were true, how would you expect your experience of the world to be different from what it is now, given that we don't have full, absolute knowledge of how our brains work and how we process information? That being said, we've actually made scary amounts of progress in predicting people's choices in a laboratory setting. But anyway, back to you, Ravi. And he said, the only escape I have is since I don't know what has been determined, I may as well not be. The whole auditorium moaned and groaned with an escape hatch that he gave for himself after telling us that we were completely determined. That's Berlinski's issue. That is actually even what people like Dawkins will concede, or uh, Pinker, you read Steven Pinker and the others. So totally determined. So the question is, were you free to ask this question? No, but does it matter? I understand that this retort sounds debasing, but what does it actually prove? How does this actually change the conversation that we're having? Does my question no longer deserve an answer? I mean, my calculator is not free to tell me that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Does that mean my calculator is incorrect? Does that mean I should disregard its answer? And besides, if I was free to ask the question, well then, to what extent, if any, was my question grounded in the real world? If we have free will, in the sense that Ravi Zacharias seems to require, then it seems that we would be free to ask any questions at all, with absolutely no grounding in physical reality. If we have free will, what guarantee is there that our questions make any more sense than if we are determined? I mean, if this is the game we're going to play instead of actually answering the questions people ask us, well, it's a multiplayer game. 1v1 me, bro. Or you could just answer the original question. Yep. Um, I don't believe any of us actually have free will because we are strictly material. So you're actually as a machine automaton asking me this question? Yes. Get over it and answer the question. This kind of name calling is not relevant to the question of whether or not God is compatible with free will. This is why you get the same questions over and over, Ravi. You never actually answer them. So you're actually as a machine automaton asking me this question? We are all made up of our past experiences. Okay, but you're not free then. You're not free. You're not making a truth statement. Sure he is. A truth statement is just a statement that accurately represents the world around us. And these statements can arise from determined minds, just as they can arise from determined calculators. Now, of course, we can debate which statements are really true, but whether or not we are determined or free to make these statements and to have these debates doesn't actually seem to impact the conversation. You're not making a truth statement. My true statement. I mean, what I'm saying is our memories and our states... No, 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 no. hear me carefully. Okay. If you're totally determined, yes. you're pre-wired to think the way you do. Nature versus nurture, yes. Sorry? Nature versus nurture. Nature versus nurture. Yes. This is how I actually first came to think that determinism was correct. 
Our thoughts and actions seem to be informed by our nature and our nurture, but we don't actually have control over these things. Even if we take control, move to a new city, start working on some personality flaw, whatever, our decision to do that was, it seems, a product of our previous nature, or our previous nurture. The buck never actually stops with us. It's nurture or nature, seemingly all the way down. In fact, this would seem to be true even if we had souls, and even if God existed. If your actions aren't fully determined by nature and nurture, then what else is causing you to decide one way or another, if not literal randomness? In what sense can you stand outside yourself, puppeteering your own actions, in the libertarian sense of free will? I don't think you can, and I don't think free will is a coherent proposition. But this isn't even relevant to the topic at hand. Do you still remember the question Ravi was originally asked? Patrick Farm remembers. Ravi Zacharias was asked the question, how can God and free will coexist as is claimed in Christianity? Five minutes later, and we still don't have an answer. Nature versus nurture. Yes. Regardless, okay. the nurture may provide a different environment, but That's the right. nature is you're hardwired yes. to come out with a certain conclusion. Out of flux, nothing but flux. You know, what you put into the computer, the ultimate is going to come out. But you have to ask yourself, are you making a truth claim? Oh, for the love of... Yes. If you are making a truth claim, you're rising above the bondage of total subjectivity. And the moment you claim a truth claim, you're violating determinism. By what possible definitions of claim, determinism, and subjectivity does this logically follow? I agree. It feels debasing to admit that determinism is true, but how does that logically affect the conversation we're having right now? Does my calculator statement have no merit because it was determined? And how does free will, which would seem to allow our decisions to be completely divorced from physical reality, somehow give our statements more credibility? And that's the end of Ravi's answer. That was his entire response to the question of how God is compatible with free will. Seems to me that there is nothing this man wouldn't do to avoid answering a simple question.